Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and open the hearing of the Northampton Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, my name is David Bloomberg, and joining me are Sarah Northrup, Maureen Scanlon, Elizabeth Silver, and Bob Riddle, and Nathan Chunk, Carolyn Mish from the City of Northampton. And uh, this um, meeting is being video recorded. And uh, we always <laughs> Uh, notice of this meeting uh, was hmm, trying to see if I have the information for when this was published. I'm not seeing it on the agenda. Um, oh, here we go. March 9th and March 16th, 2023. Uh, notice of this hearing was published. And um, we only have one item on the agenda. Um, but before we get to that item, we always start with um, an opportunity for public comment. This would be if members of the public are present who would like to address the board about topics that are not on the agenda tonight. So I will ask if there's anyone here from the public who would like to address the board about topics or matters other than the special permit um, that is on the agenda for tonight. And I, uh, Nathan, you could confirm there are no hands going up. No one's asking to, to give public comment. Yeah. No. Okay. Nobody. Okay. Seeing nobody, we'll we'll move on. It's past five thirty, so we can um, op open the uh, hearing on the application for a special permit um, by Lynn. Osner, oh, no, those are the minutes, I'm sorry. Um, what am I looking at? I'm looking at the wrong minutes, I am so sorry. I mean, I'm looking at the wrong agenda. Now I am looking at the correct agenda. Okay, uh, let's back this up. Notice of today's hearing was published on March 30th and April 6th. And we are ready to hear the application for a special permit by Lance Curley for a home business with non-resident employees at 123 Meadow Street, Florence, map ID 22B-066. And I would ask everybody who addressed as the board, please, to start by giving your name and address for the record that's being kept. And we always start with a brief presentation of the application by the applicant and followed by uh, an opportunity for the board members to ask questions. And, um, and then members of the public, if any, uh, will have an opportunity to ask questions about this permit application as well after the board asks its questions. And then after that, if we feel we have enough information, we can move to close the public hearing after which we cannot have any more input from the applicant or the public. And after that, typically we would have a motion on the actual application for the special permit. But one step at a time, first I'll ask the applicants to introduce yourselves and give a brief presentation for materials in front of us as well. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello, my name is Lance Curley, and I live at 123 Meadow Street in Florence with my wife, Jacqueline, who's sitting next to me, Jacqueline Layton. And um, we operate a home business from this location. And uh, the purpose of our special permit is uh, to request permission to have two non-resident uh, staff that work for our company commute to the property for the purposes of doing business here at our home business, which is classic colonial homes. And uh, would you like more information than that, David? Or um, I know that there's been a, quite a bit of back and forth um, between the Office of Planning and Sustainability and, and you. Yeah. <laughs> and so maybe you could touch on some of the questions that have been raised and your responses to those questions, because I would anticipate that the whole board uh, is probably gonna need to hear a little bit more 
um, about um, about the questions that were raised by the by the city in response to your application. Okay, uh, happy to provide that. So um, we evaluated the home business criteria and have determined that we feel that we meet all of the parameters uh, that are listed um, in the home business definition 352.1 uh, with the exception of two non-resident employees that, that work here at our company. And there was a list of uh, questions pertaining to the specifics of the situation. And I presented that to um, Nathan Chung in response to those questions. And I can kind of expand on those. So uh, the, the first question was um, to provide a clear breakdown of the number of visits per week by visitor types to our property to establish that we don't uh, exceed the allowable 25 visits per week. And I provided a breakdown, um, which was Jacqueline and I run the company and we reside here. Um, and we have uh, 10 total staff members uh, of which we are two. So we have eight employees that work uh, under our oversight. Um, and with the exception of two of those eight, all of the other staff members are field contractors that uh, spend their working days Monday through Friday uh, on job sites and, and working on projects. So their visits are limited to roughly one a week. Um, sorry, once, once a month when we ask them to come here to the property for uh, a monthly site on-site team meeting. And uh, so that's listed uh, among the other visits. So for the two employees, they each work from Monday through Friday. So they're visiting the site once a day and they, they, they work, uh, one works in our office which is located in our uh, one of the accessory buildings on our property. And the other works in our woodworking shop, which is located in a separate but adjacent uh, barn. barn, which is another accessory to, to the residences. Um, and in addition to that, um, as the you know, comings and goings uh, change kind of from week to week. I, I took a conservative average um, after seeing, you know, your request for detailed information. And we've established that uh, we receive roughly four total deliveries for the company per week. Um, and those would include um, occasional deliveries of office supplies from like a UPS delivery person or a um, possibly a, a lumber yard coming to deliver some materials to, to our, to our wood shop. Um, for clients, we are mostly a remote company and um, we've been working kind of uh, for the last 30 years for clients all over the country. And a lot of times we never meet in person and we, um, you know, work kind of by zoom um, and we've done that for going on 30 years now. So our actual client site visits are, are very limited and we intentionally keep them from visiting us because uh, we prefer to, to kind of do the work we do here in the office. And, you know, um, so hosting clients is, is a rare event. And I, I would say on the high side, we have two visits a month from either prospective clients that are coming to visit and meet us or a client that we're currently working with that, that might schedule a, a, an office visit, but they're only by schedule and appointment only. And therefore we allow some control over that. Um, we also work with local contractors and subcontractors and they are primarily on job sites assisting our construction team. Um, 
but I accounted for two site visits weekly from contractors who could be um, anyone from, um, you know, a plumber coming by to pick up a check or a vendor perhaps that, you know, schedules an appointment to come and drop off some literature that we need, those types of visits. But they're, um, they're intentionally kept under control. And um, some, there are weeks that we don't have any guests and we maintain the property in such a way that we're not um, basically uh, welcoming visitors, so to speak. This is, you know, clearly a residential property with a bunch of outbuildings. And um, so we've established that and intend on kind of keeping control of that. Um, we're acutely aware of traffic patterns in this uh, kind of portion of town along our street. And um, we are aware of the fact that there are certain community resources here that are next door and across the street from us that draw quite a bit of traffic and that impacts us. Um, but we're happy to have it because it's, uh, you know, in, enriches the environment here for our community. Um, and our, our take on that is that the Florence ball fields and the community gardens across the street mostly attract their visitors on evenings during the week uh, and weekends, uh, which are specifically times that our company is closed for business and we have no activity or traffic other than residential. So we feel like our, um, our, our, our hours of operation dovetail nicely to mitigate traffic and uh, impact traffic in that regard. Um, and so that's essentially the kind of visits and question one. Um, so if, if you total those up, um, you know, each, each of the two employees count for 10, 10 visits a week. Um, and then we'll add another one um, because there's four staff that visit us, visit us once monthly as a requirement. And then, you know, uh, so, so we're at 11. And then four deliveries a week put us at 15 and then two client visits a month. So that's, you know, on the high side once a week, but rarely. Um, so, and, and then contractors for two visits a week. So we're, we're around 20 visits a week on average and that's a conservative average. Um, and I think there are often times when it's a lot uh, quieter than that. So. Um, and we're aware of, of that 25 times or less limit. So, you know, that we're cognizant of that and, and uh, work to control that. Um, any questions about that? I'll ask, I'll ask the board members if they have questions. Not so far. Um, Mr. Chair, may I say something before? Sure, of course. Yeah, furthering. Yeah, so yes. Uh, so one thing that really generated a lot of question and including a site visit was, um, so when it comes to home business, uh, there are two ordinance sections that largely apply. One is the 350-2.1 uh, or just 2.1 definition of home business. And one of the main thing is it has a, a requirement that um, the business use area be capped at 40% of the combined gross floor area of the home, the main residential building plus accessory structure used for the business. So that number was initially in some some uh, some confusion and I apologize some of the confusion due to me, but I've done a lot of research on that and think we have a good number. So that's one of the things in question. And so um, I think I believe the applicant has done his calculation using his own uh, revised measures, but we right now also have a, 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 a um, accurate, you know, reliable calculation using the assessor's data on that number. So the 2.1 area requirement, the 40% maximum area requirement, that's one of the main topics in question. And then what the applicant just spoke of largely is about um, 10.12, which is a special permit for um, home businesses that might not 
or exceed some of the requirements in 2.1. And the 2.1 requirement, uh, there is no 10.12 uh, provision for exceeding the 40% um, maximum requirement stated in 2.1. So I have prepared some presentation that I can present at the chair's discretion showing the calculations. So that is a one relevant uh, matter for you to consider prior to um, going with the, uh, considering further issues about the special permit. So I'm just uh, bringing all that up. Uh, um, and so, so that, yes, excuse me. So what you're what you're saying is that we have a discrepancy between how your office is calculating the percentage, which results in a calculation of the use of the accessory structures exceeding 40 percent. And the applicants have presented a different their own calculation of that percentage, which results in a in in a conclusion that they are within the 40 per they're below the 40 percent cap no not in in my uh, revised calculation using only the assessor's data the applicant's uh, business uh, is still within the 40 percent but it is still at a higher percent because uh, our uh, the applicant's new numbers are a little different but both of our numbers are uh, within the 40% limit, but there is a discrepancy in the size of the buildings that we use for the calculation or the area if, of the buildings. But if both of the numbers are below 40%, isn't it no harm, no foul there within the 40%? Uh, um, uh, yes, we can state that. Um, it's about for clarification, I'm stating that. So it's up to your chair's discretion on how we uh, proceed and whether you want to spend much time on the well, presentation well, uh, of facts. Uh, Yep. Excuse, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Let me put yep. it a different way. Yeah. Even if we accept your calculation, which is higher percentage than the applicant's calculation, it's still within 40 percent, below 40 percent. So it still satisfies the restriction in the section of the ordinance, correct? Yes. Um, okay. If, if that's the case, I'll, I'm interested in what other board members think, but I'm not sure it's it's net it's necessary to compare the two analyses if if both lead to the conclusion that the percentage is less than 40 percent so we don't have a, a a violation of that maximum percentage in the ordinance do, do other what do other people think am i going off on the wrong tangent here um nathan did you i'm sorry Maureen, I agree yeah. with you, David. Or Bob, okay. And Maureen, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, I, I, um, I would be curious um, to know if these numbers become part of, you know, the records and um, the business owners or the applicants uh, would like to, you know, could see that they might have increased their floor area while staying with it as their business grows while staying underneath that 40% threshold, would it be important to get an understanding of what the actual numbers are? And uh, that, I mean, that's, I guess, procedural, I don't know. And um, is it, I guess, maybe a question for Nathan, but is it unusual or is it common for the numbers to vary because the assessor's numbers are based on whenever the last actual assessment was. I saw that in one um, one of the, the zoning permit requests, there was a note that there had been new construction uh, on the accessory unit. Has that changed it? The applicant has indicated, I think somewhere we saw the applicant has indicated an additional amount of residential space as an attic apartment. I, I, I feel that we should figure out how to record um, these, at least the awareness of these discrepancies. Well, could I ask the applicant, do you care if we use the city's numbers since they satisfy the restriction? I'm just sort of trying to avoid going into an analysis that for which there may be no reason. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to respond to that. Um, First and foremost, Nathan and I worked cooperatively over the last 72 hours to kind of establish uh, what parameters would be used to make this calculation. And, you know, there was a question as to whether our 
recently. It's not actually an apartment in our attic. It's just a, a, a bed, you know, a living space. We, we just basically in, he, heated and now have a bedroom in our attic. Um, and the, that was, um, that was something that only changed the percentage uh, of, of the calculation by 1%. So with, with using the assessor's official data, which we determined prior to the meeting starting would be uh, the calculation that we used, we're at 29.4%. So we're nowhere near the 40. And, and with my, uh, you know, uh, calculation, we were in the 28 and change range. So we, as applicants, don't mind if we either table this or don't address it at all, because I feel like, you know, either calculation works well within the boundaries and we're not even close. And Nathan, do you agree with that, that either calculation works within the boundaries and we're not even close? Um, my, uh, so I, I, one concern I have is, so while in the current um, status, um, most of the agreements not agree, but the thing is, um, the applicant is, you know, expanding and updating his property, depending on which part of the property expands, the residential area or accessory structure area that is not allocated, that's not used for the business. It's depending on how he exp um, he expands the, the the structures on his property, future calculations may be affected. So there may be some validity in trying to at least solidify some numbers. One possibility is we can get a number of what that 40% maximum area is. And the other thing to consider is, um, although the discrepancy might be a couple hundred to a thousand feet or square feet, or so, so I have to look at the table to get a better accurate number, but it's, you know, it's not a, a huge discrepancy, but it is still a discrepancy. So for us to reliably both comply uh, with the regulation and also to make sure it can be enforced, we do need some way to have a more consistent set of data and measurement. Well, but don't they, don't they, go ahead, please. I was just gonna yes. ask, uh, just to, if they expand the accessory structures that aren't being used for the business or they expand the residential area and the main residential, doesn't that make the percentage even lower? Yes, on the other hand, uh, the sort of the tricky thing about this ordinance is if the applicant decides to expand the uh, business use area within the uh, within the existing accessory structure or a home structure that is already using the, some of the space as the home business. So it all depends on whether the structures are already using a portion of the space for the home business. If the applicant decides to expand the, the um, business use area within an existing structure that is already used for the home business, it will um, up the percentage. And but you it, based know. your calculation, I think of the 32% in the revised calculations on full use of the accessory structures that they're only using a portion of, right? So I think that's a, a, like outdated. So even if they expand yeah. that accessory building that they're partially using to full use, they're still coming in under the 40%, right? Well, the, um, possibly, I have to run the numbers, but it all depends on how large the expansion is. But, but why are we talking yeah. about an expansion that hasn't happened? It right. does, isn't, why, we can't anticipate now what may have in the, happen in the future. And, and if they're gonna exceed 40%, they're gonna to have to come back. And, but, and they have to and come also, back anyway they have to in come, a year. They have to come back in a yes. year anyway. Right, yeah. exactly. So maybe the way to settle this just as a thought is if the applicants would be willing to agree for the record that we are going to use the city's current calculation as a benchmark, then when you come back in a year, if you've done an expansion, <clears throat> We will know that we use the city's calculation as a benchmark and we can look again, but it's only if you expand. I mean, we don't know if you're gonna expand. Are you planning to expand? You don't have to even answer that. It, so am I, does that make sense to people? Yes, totally. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, I'd like to sure. note, I, I really appreciate the work the applicant and Nathan have done uh, digging into the numbers, kind of uh, okay. really analyzing it. Um, the, the two things that um, I would note is that 
um, the uses, whether it's in a residential building or a barn, either one, the uses are within the walls. The assessor calculations measure the outside perimeter. So if you're, if you're really talking about accuracy, you have wall thicknesses and all of that. And, uh, and you can certainly get into the weeds with those numbers um, if you want to. Well, that's right. not. <laughs> but, but, I'm not particularly but, concerned. But if you're if if you're talking about um, saying about putting a contingency, we haven't even gotten this far yet. But I wouldn't want to use a precise calculation um, in a in permit language uh, uh, without uh, without. You know, I'm an engineer and I like real numbers. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, and well, Nathan, what what is your reaction to my suggestion that we that if the applicants have no objection, we just use your calculation to establish a benchmark. And then when they come back in a year, as they are required to do, at least at that point in time, we will have a record that we used your calculation. I think maybe Sarah's point is, well, whose calculation is correct, but I'm, because I'm not an engineer, my, my, my reaction is it's kind of a no harm, no foul situation. And if the city's calculation, yours, Nathan, is more conservative and the applicants don't have an objection with that, does that address, Nathan, your, your sort of concern or viewpoint? Uh, y yes, Chair. Um... Yes, and uh, I think if uh, the if the percentage becomes an issue, for example, um, hmm, so if somehow there is a nine percent, right? right? Yes, forty percent. Right. Yeah, that's but that's a that's a theoretical scenario which we haven't reached, and right. uh, you know I think at that time you know properly measuring the business use area to get its percentage, a portion of the overall area that'll, you know, become relevant at that point. But right now, as it stands, um, it, it is based on the assessor's data. Uh, the applicant is within the 40% uh, requirement. Um, and right. Seems like, yes, uh, the chair, uh, the chair right. and the board's uh, ideas. Um, I, I, right. I think I, 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 I concur. So thank great. And I also take some comfort in knowing that our applicants are architectural designers. I think <laughs> they, they are certainly capable of making sure that they don't exceed the, the 40% since they know that that's sort of a line in the sand that cannot be crossed because it, it would require a variance. And, and now you're just in, in, you've got a major problem. Yeah. So, um, so what are the other issues, if I can ask, I, I, either Nathan or the applicants or uh, uh, that we need to consider here because I, I, I was, I knew that the 40% was a, you know, could have been a concern and it sounds like we're okay on that. It sounds like we resolved that. I just want to, um, if I may, you posed a question to the applicants, David, yes. that I'm not sure I actually got a, an answer. We heard an answer to about whether or not they're willing to accept the city's calculations. Yeah. So if we can just get uh, over it, latent clarification from them on that? Yeah, I saw a nod, but I, I think okay. yeah, your we point, are, Elizabeth, we, we, for, for the, the record, record yes. we're, we're <laughs> willing to accept that the assessor's data will be used to establish a baseline calculation. And in following years, we will pivot off of that number should anything change, which at the moment, for the record, it's not our intention to change anything. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Shall I continue of... through the questions that were asked specifically just to kind of broaden the information regarding this, or I can hold off on that? Can we just uh, go back to Nathan and check in? I think this was your question, David. What else is, um, you know, we understand what um, 350 2.1 requires in terms of a home business, and we can put in those conditions in any order. But is there anything that's in contention now once this um, square footage issue is resolved? 
that the city has concerns about besides what's in 2.1? Yes, um, the, the sort of the trigger that started this process was the concern that, um, and it's also, so I, I had sent in the applicant um, uh, about, uh, yes, yeah, so six additional questions after his permit application. And it includes, one of the questions includes this very question I'm about to bring up to the board. Uh, one one main trigger for this process was that the applicant applied for a septic system for 12 people, which is higher than the stated number of a total of 10 employees, including the two owners themselves in the calculation. So that's uh, that's one thing, you know. Um, I mean, if the if you, the board allows the applicant to proceed with the the rest of the answers to those six questions, the applicant just went to the first one. Um, you know, the, the applicant will be able to address that. So that was one of the main triggers. And the, um, and you know, the, the, the 10.12, so the 40% question I believe has been adequately discussed, um, but 10.12, the special permit conditions, some of the factors to consider are, um, you know, where are things being stored and, uh, you know, and how many employees and other visitors which the applicant has covered. But the, the main question I think at this point is the, the septic uh, question. Is it the septic question or the number of employees? Um, I think a, a better way is uh, actually not just the number of employees, but total number of visitors in general, you know, and a more detailed breakdown, number of employees, um, visitors, clients, um, deliveries, contractors, and so on. And residents in the, in the living units. They're all on one system, right? You've got a house and a yeah. couple apartments. I can give you some background. And I'll, if I answer question three, um, I think that'll bring some clarity to it. So we have two separate septic systems on the property that serve the three addresses, uh, the residences. So we the main house that we occupy with our family has a uh, in-law suite attached to it. And uh, we have a detached four bedroom house at the rear of the property. And that is supported by a separate septic system on our property. So we have a total of two compliant, you know, recently tested Title V past septic systems. When, um, when it became, how should I put this? It became inconvenient to have um, our, our two staff members using our primary residence bathroom when they were here. So we submitted uh, an application to put in a composting toilet within uh, the barn structure. And um, upon doing that, we came to find that a composting system is kind of more of a seasonal approach because it freezes solid in the winter and goes offline. So we contacted a subcontractor that is a, a trusted resource for our business to help us establish whether a repair was uh, advisable. And upon inspecting the site, Mark Thompson from Hilltown Environmental, who's a licensed uh, septic engineer and hydrologist, um, reviewed the conditions and determined that rather than repairing the system that is currently in place, if the PERC results uh, in this new location on site were compliant, that it might make more sense to actually put in a small conventional system and, you know, call it, it, it would be a, essentially a repair of the existing system, but it, it's, it's a new third septic on the property. So he did the park, it passed. He submitted plans to the Board of Health. This was several months ago. And on that permit application, it's stated that um, this design uh, would serve or accommodate up to 13 employees, which is why 12 employees were listed on that, which raised a red flag within like interdepartmentally because we're a home business. When in fact, the smallest conventional system 
by way of calculation that can be installed as a repair to this you know, dysfunctional composting system that we invested quite a bit in uh, and have been struggling with for the past four years. Um, that's, that's the size of system that would serve 12 or 13 staff, which is why that number went on the application. However, we don't have 12 or 13 staff. We only have 10 to our residents and use the, you know, the house bathroom. So it would not be getting enough that much use, but that's the smallest system that can be put in. So, so, so it's over designed. It's but over designed. That, but, but that doesn't equate to you saying you're going to have 12 people there. No, it in was fact, just, your app, your, 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 the permit would be limited to a lesser number, notwithstanding the capacity of the septic system. Am right. I understanding your position correctly? Yeah, so it was never our intention to bring that many staff members onto the property. We function quite efficiently in the organizational structure and size that we are now. In fact, we've recently lost some staff. So, you know, we, um, you know, Mark Thompson's official statement was that according to Title V, an office use requires a design flow of 75 um, gallons per day per thousand square feet with a required minimum flow rate of 200 gallons per day, you know, and he references some, some code in there. And basically using that criteria, the system that he designed can accommodate 13 staff, which is why he listed that, but it was never the intention to serve that many because we don't have that many. And he mentioned that additionally, due to the complexity of this site being in close proximity to the resource area, that he advised that it made sense to slightly, you know, over design the system to extend its functional life, which is considered good engineering practice and that he could substantiate that um, personally and professionally beyond this statement if need be. But there's no right. smaller system of a conventional type and that that would also be compliant for this location. And so he he basically has, you know, a small Thank compliance you. system based on this criteria that he's proposed. Right. So that's and, where the confusion and, and the bottom line is the special permits going to, if it's granted, will have as one of its conditions, a limit on the number of employees allowed on the premises. There are, do other people have questions about that? Because I, I think that, I mean, I'm personally, I'm comfortable with that explanation. And, and there's a lot to be said for over-designing. Um, so, uh, the, so some of the, go ahead. I can go on to question four, how many parking lots are on site and where are they located? I actually did a little site map I don't know if a screen share is uh, prudent, but I'd be happy to, to share with you, you know, the Google Earth image of our property and overlay that with this map um, to show you, you know, roughly where our designated parking zones are, but it's quite organized to maintain traffic flow and designate spots for, you know, company business and residential and visitor business separate from the company. Uh, the property is laid out in such a way that the business is kind of completely separate from the residential aspects of the property. And we, we work to maintain that because we have a busy household with five children and it doesn't work well when things, you know, uh, cr cross or combine. So, um, we've gone to measures to, to try to, you know, and all, everyone knows where they're supposed to park and it's all, you know, anything business related is far back from the street and pretty much uh, difficult to see from the street due to the fact that it's behind the residential structure kind of nested in the back corner. So. Right. I'd, and thank you. I'd like to ask Nathan, um, are, are there is is I, I don't there isn't a specific mandatory number of parking spaces right is this just generally go to whether the site can accommodate the nature of the activities you know that are being engaged in uh, 
I, that's my understanding, but um, there is minimum number of parking required, which the applicant seems to meet. The other factor is uh, when it comes to uh, home, uh, actually commercial business in general, there are some parking restrictions. Um, commercial home business use parking lots can't cross property. My understanding that that is um, you can really have, uh, uh, you know, in order for people to access a uh, parking lot in home, home business, you can have the vehicle cross from one property to another, but I believe all the parking is happening within, uh, within the uh, within the um, perimeter of the property. Okay, and so so you you or or your staff Nathan have looked at the question of the compliance with the proposed or existing parking with the city's requirements, and there and and you're comfortable that there's no concern about non-compliance. Right. If yeah, I'm looking at the uh, I'm looking at the uh, site map the applicant provided. So, um, actually, one thing I wasn't super clear about uh, from looking at the site map, I want to raise the applicant if that's okay. Sure. The uh, the parking lots you marked on the site map are these um, paved? Are these paved? Paved. Yeah, or paved or graveled? It's a mix. It's a mix. Yes, but yeah, otherwise, so the parking parking lot seems to be fine. Okay, so I definitely want the record to reflect that or the minutes or whatever. Right, let me. Um, so, and then the next one was number five about commercial vehicles, unregistered vehicles and equipment. Uh, before, before the applicant answers, because I think I've seen the answer to this, Nathan, what, what, is there a specific concern there or it was just curiosity? Um, it's uh, in in some other instances, some home businesses have uh, many, you know, I'm not saying the applicant is, but in, in other instances, home businesses have uh, um, many unregistered vehicles and other problem um, parts on the property. So um, perhaps maybe it's out of purview of the board, but I was just raising that as a potential concern to consider. Okay. Um, and I think the answer was there was one or two pieces of equipment and uh, maybe the applicant should, could just quickly confirm the answer to that question. Yeah, sure. Us. So, so um, we, we have two pickup trucks, uh, those that are, that are registered. We use those for business and also as our primary personal vehicles. Um, the only uh, let's see, there's no, we have a, a farm tractor, uh, which is this little red tractor we bought that we use for our kind of goats and, and chickens to kind of, you know, clean up. Cl clean up. <laughs> um, we keep that primarily parked in our tobacco barn. So it's out of sight. And, uh, we have a, a blue forklift, uh, primarily that piece of equipment was purchased for on-site work and most times that is actually not here at the property, but at a, uh, a client's house doing work. Um, and we have a snow plow and- uh, That's attached, just no a, attached. A, a plow that we leave in our tobacco barn and store. And, uh, and we also have trailers. a couple of trailers. We have a flatbed trailer uh, to move our, our tractor from here to there. And, um, and a dump trailer that we use during demolition of, of projects on renovation and projects. And they're all registered with plates. So, you know, we, yeah. we go to great lengths to try to keep our property free and clear of refuse or oddball equipment. Uh, it's an eyesore to us as well. We're exceedingly proud of our historical property and its location is very visible. And, uh, you know, we get a we get a lot of feedback, positive feedback from our efforts here on site to kind of maintain and upkeep and and you know provide um, a nice looking property. So that um, you know that that's of concern to us always. So, okay. Anyone else have any questions about that? Have, um, and um, please, yeah, sure. It's not about that, but I I do have two questions that have to do with um, 350-2.1, but they did not necessarily come up in these questions. 
So I don't know what well, place are um, meeting we should I should voice those. Well, I guess we can either go through, finish this list of questions and then get to that, or take a break from this list of questions if if you want if you'd like to get to yours, Maureen. These might be a break. Um, okay. Here, there is a break. Um, okay. One is um, about the signage. Um, the um, it looks like three fifty two point one says H says no more than one sign of one square foot in area may be displayed advertising the home business. And I understand from the application, there's a sign that I think um, Lance said was two two by three feet, which is more than that. And that's just a question to raise. Does that require a special permit? And then the other is uh, having to do with potential noise level in L. If they're doing um, you know, woodworking, manufacturing, uh, the item says it shall produce no noise, odors, da, 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 which would be detectable to normal sensory perception beyond the lot line. So I would just want to clarify how much of the, um, how much of the wood, how much is being done there in terms of manufacturing that might pose a question about noise levels? Should I answer that? Please, yes, yes, please. Yes, sure. So um, our our little wood shop uh, produces architectural packages for the homes we design in kind of like a kit. Uh, we purchase raw materials, usually lumber, boards, um, and we bring them into our wood shop, which is within the large hay barn um, at the rear left corner um, to the northeast corner of, of the hay barn. And, you know, all of our woodworking equipment, table saws and chop saws and, and things are there housed within that space. So um, the space is well insulated with spray foam. And, um, you know, I'd invite anyone to come over and kind of, you know, see what we do, but I've never received any noise complaints. Uh, Barbara Bricker is a neighbor who's our, arguably our closest neighbor. Um, one, of them, yeah. one of them. And uh, I don't know, maybe, do you have any feedback, Robert? It doesn't bother me. And I live 150 feet from the barn when this is in production and I don't hear it from inside the house on the property. No, nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing. The most noisy thing around is the fields, of course, where the kids play and a few hummingbirds. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And Ms. Bricker, just it, it, while while you're speaking, did you have anything else you wanted to say that so that we don't make you wait longer to? Well, it's kind of fascinating to. to oh, you're welcome listen. to stay and listen. I just wanted but to give you a my chance. Name, to... My name is Barbara Bricker. Mm -hmm. I live at 64 Meadow Street. I've owned that property for two years. I also resided at 48 Meadow Street from 1948 to 1966. So mm. as far as knowing anything about Meadow Street, I'm the girl, yeah. I'm the woman, I'm sorry. I'm the lady, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so, Understood. And uh, you know, Lance's sensitivity to his history really resonates with me. I've seen the property in detail. He did a wonderful tour that involved uh, the David Ruggle Center and so forth. And, and uh, he has done nothing but improve things. I can't speak to all these rules, you know, but right. but he really has been a tremendous asset. And classic colonial homes, if you go online, it's just a wow. There's no question okay. about it. And the other thing is, you know, I think these are all residential rules. It's hardly a residential area. I'm on the other side of the river. The houses are on the other side of the river. You cross the river and there's... 123 on the right and grow Northampton on the left. And then, you know, past 123, there's the Florence Fields and then there's Spring Street that crosses. And on the other side of Spring Street is 1812 Auto Body. And, you know, there's houses on Spring Street. I mean, it, I don't want it to be a commercial area either, but when you, you've done a site visit, you must have the sense that this very mild 
maybe that's the wrong word, but but this very mild property that is integrated into the property. And you know, it was a, a dairy farm after the, you know, years ago, mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, I and I know that Lance has, I, I know Lance, he's not really a close friend, but a, we have a very friendly relationship. I just think if Lance wants it done at his property, yes, go ahead and. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. It raises a, a question for Nathan. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Bricker. Um, Nathan, um, it just remind me, I'm blanking. Are these are these permits like this usually personal to the current applicant? So that, for example, if they were to sell their property in two or three years. It, it, the next people would not get the benefit of this permit. I'm just blanking on this. Yeah, let me double check. But I, I believe it is not transferable. I'm just gonna look up the ordinance. There is actually a, a last section of the 10.12. Um, hey, yes, um, yes, it's explicitly stated in the special permit. All special permits for home businesses are non-transferable. And are specifically issued to specific perfect, applicants. Perfect. That makes sense. Course, yes. Perfect. Okay. That, that, I think that gives should give people comfort um, that you know that we're dealing with these applicants and uh, and we don't need to worry about someone else moving in and trying to operate the same business uh, who might not be as sensitive to some of these concerns. Uh, uh, any anything else? Um, I'm, I'm looking. Uh, at the back at the list, maybe we've. Uh, I guess I'll just ask: Do, do the board members feel the need to? Uh, look Nathan at, just had his hand up. David, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Another please. Issue. Yeah. So, um, I I I think the sign is potentially a problem based on the two point requirement, as Maureen raised. But that's not uh, the matter on the table right now in the application. So that might be something we missed, but uh. Yes, uh, it is a it is a potential um, a little conflict with the ordinance. I do recall reading something in the application about changing the sign from wooden to something or something to wooden. I, I'm not sure. So I don't know if that puts it on the table or not. But um, did, do you, there are several different pieces to this that I read. So was that one of them that you were looking to change the sign? So the sign conversation goes way back um, before we purchased the property, we went and met with Carolyn to establish whether we would be allowed to have our business here. And there were questions on that zoning application that was approved specific to existing signage on the site when, you know, when we were looking to purchase the property. Um, and, uh, you know, we asked whether there's this signpost that's two foot by three foot that's rusted old, you know, it's part of a, like a farm plow that was all welded together by some previous owner when they used to farm here. And it's obviously got some age to it. And uh, the original sign from the previous owner was hanging on that. And so we asked permission in that application if we could use that existing, you know, maybe grandfathered post in the yard to put a small equally sized sign on. And we were given permission at that time. And I have submitted that to the records. And then at some point after that, the sign came in, sign came into question because um, we had, we had a, a hand carved wooden sign made um, which was going in roughly the same location, but being ground mounted, and it was it was denied, and so we you know we didn't we couldn't prove that the the original um, post had been there. Um, it was in the grandfather because we didn't have any imagery showing it. So we had we had a sign made assuming because oh well we originally had spoken about it and we had this approval or had been informed I should say with an approval saying if you have a grandfathered sign in that you can put you know a sign there but um, we didn't have any proof that 
the sign was indeed a grandfather sign. So um, where it was left at the time, Lou Hasbrook was the commissioner and uh, we discussed it on multiple it occasions. And, and he said, I will allow you to fasten this wooden sign to the side of your office building in lieu of, pun intended, putting it on the front yard uh, at a different location than the current old metal sign frame sits. And we opted not to because it costs close to $10,000 to have it hand carved by this local artist. And it's two-sided and it was just going to- You wouldn't be able to necessarily see it well from like the- It didn't farm. make sense for us to destroy the sign drilling a bunch of holes through it. It wasn't hand carved to do that. So it wasn't that important to us. So we have it on display inside our office instead. <laughs> Okay, so but this really isn't even part of this. No, we're, we're not asking about the sign, right? right. But but, but right. I can so. specify. I can specify to ask or to to uh, address Maureen's point that I recognize that the zoning designation for home business limits your signage to a foot square, and the sign that we have out there that's hanging on the post is you know, a wooden framed, roughly 20 inches by 30 inch size. It is not 12 by 12 inches, but I, you know, and so we never, we were, we were never officially told to take down what we have there. And we were told officially, you cannot put up what you had carved and that's where it was left. So currently we have maybe a non-conforming sign that's pre-existing that I, I do have a 2015 document that says that the sign can stay. So, but that again, that's not part of what correct. we're considering. I just wanted here to today. give you the whole so, background. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But we, I guess we don't really need to go into any more. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'd, like, I'd like I'd like to kind of narrow back to right. the essentials here. But thank you for we. I mean, we asked you for an explanation. Um, right. So. Um, uh, where let's see where does this leave us the um, last question that was asked out of the six questions that nathan sent was what kind of materials are being delivered and stored there and clarify that and so you know it's a couple quick sentences we, we get deliveries of uh light building materials generally it's it's wood siding or wood trim um you know delivered by one of the local lumber companies um and, you know, that could be lumber. Uh, occasionally we get lighting or plumbing fixtures for current projects. We do not inventory any materials here. We only purchase products that have been predetermined and, you know, agreed upon with the customer. And uh, they're brought in here to invent, like to just account for and make sure that they're correct. And then they you know, are, are, are brought to the job site rather than having it delivered to the site because most local vendors won't site deliver uh, this type of, of material. Or in the case of our wood shop, if it's something we're fabricating, let's say we're building a cupola for someone or, you know, window trim, it needs to be prepared in our little wood shop first until it's complete and then it, you know, goes out for delivery. So, um, we always put our materials within our structure for safety and security and also to keep it out of eyesight. There are occasional situations, which we happen to be in right this minute, when we are under a construction permit with the town to make a, a principal adjustment. In this case, it's to our office building right now. We're renovating and adjusting the structure within the third portion of the remaining portion of our office building, which needed to be updated and, and ins insulated properly. And so there are certain material piles covered with tarps that are adjacent to it while we're finishing that. But we should be wrapped up on the exterior, uh, you know, by summertime. And then the site will be free of material and equipment again uh, when the permit card comes down out of the window. So, um, that's the that's the answer to that. 
Okay, and that's not you. part of the regular business. What you're doing in terms of renovation is not related to the materials that are being delivered and stored in relation to your business. Correct. You know, owning and operating and residing here under, you know, uh, the conditions that we, we live with, with all these old historic buildings that are melting as, you know, every time you turn around, something needs to be repaired. You know, we, we're engaged with the town regularly for our business. So of course we're pulling permits and doing things under uh, their advice and guidance uh, for our home renovation stuff as well. But those are kind of, you know, limited smaller projects. Um, that's, you know, why we're non-compliant right now with some siding behind our office building waiting to be nailed up, so. Okay. Um, anything else that the uh, board would like to hear about? Um, by the way, we could at least state for the record that our that any permit we grant does not include an overt approval of the sign. Just to go back to the sign for a minute, because yeah. it's really not part of the application. Whether their sign is in compliance with or not is not addressed here and is not implicitly approved by a grant of a, of a of an a, the application for the special permit okay uh, um Understood. the the um anything else from the board uh, in terms of uh questions for the applicants no other questions for me none thank for you. me thank you um nathan uh, May, oh yes, please. Yeah, yeah sorry, yes, Chair. I think one factor for the applicant to state for the board to consider is the number of hours, uh, the hours of operation, and you know, so that's something. yeah. I, I do think yeah. that that um, to have a little bit of discussion here that um, where I'm going with this, in my if, if, you know, speaking for myself, I should say, is that we should have a you know some conditions, including that. And I'm looking at the board's uh, staff, uh, the staff memo that goods shall not be offered for sale on the site. The hours of operation should be expressly stated. So maybe I could just ask the applicants. I assume you won't have an objection to a, a prohibition on selling goods from the site. Correct. Okay. We, we, so we, we, we have chickens and we sell. Okay. We sell no, we're, I'm talking about the home business, not, okay. not you know, okay. not. We, we I'm do also, sell I'm, eggs. If yeah, anybody is interested in right. blue eggs, yeah. we have no, them. no. We're we're only talking about the home business. Okay. In fact, some, yes, like so, and then and then the hours of operation should be expressly stated in the special permit. So what what are your current regular hours? We're I think open it's, uh, from our office is open from eight to five daily Monday okay. to Friday. Okay. Do any board members have any problem with that? Um, and then um, the hours and frequency of deliveries, number of clients seen, number of employees. Number of employees we're limiting to two, correct? That's the only. That's the whole reason we're here, right? Because you have employees, and that's why you've got to come here for a special permit, right? And yep. it's two employees, and you don't have a problem with the limitation on, to two employees. So correct? I'd like to be more specific. So we have staff that are licensed off-site, yeah, that are working yeah. off-site. Yeah. Yeah, we're not but, talking about remote work. Okay. We're talking about employees on site. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, okay. we th there's four total, Jacqueline and I, and then two that commute to work daily. Well, we're not talking about the owners of the of the house. That's you, right? So, our, so not correct. us. Our two employees that do are non-residents. Yeah, that's okay. why we're here. So we'll be limited to two non-resident employees. Um. um the uh, let's see the frequency the number of employees, product and materials on site shall be expressly stated. I don't know what that means. What does it mean, Nathan, that products and or materials on site shall be expressly stated in the permit? I think uh, you know it's more focused for ones that produce uh, produce. Oh, uh, but but you don't goods, really produce product. You don't produce I, goods. But I think still considering that you know there is some woodworking done using the materials the applicant just described, I think it helps to explicitly list those in the condition if it's required to be stated. And I believe the 
So um, I would we'll say see. not applicable. Yeah, that would give me yeah, some concern to and, go into any specifics of um, the product that gets made in the woodworking shop. So I, I don't think we really can, can we just say that. that they'll always be uh, kept in indoors <laughs> so that they're not bothering anybody. Yeah, that's our like I stated, um, you know, if if we make something, we want it to be out of the weather yep. and secure. So it's not, you know, I mean, we, we don't want people breaking into our barn, of course, but it's much more subject. We, we're, we're in a public area. There's a lot of traffic day and night on this road. And occasionally people drive in because it looks like a park or they're curious. And so we go to Great Lakes to keep it contained within the buildings for that reason. Okay. So, and then and then the, the total allowed number of employees on site generally is going to be the two right the two yeah. non-resident employees number right. of client visits per week what would be comfortable for you if i listed as two per month oh, so month. it's okay. not even a weekly thing but okay I think we we have room within under the 25 to even host a weekly client visit and still not exceed the 25 but if you want to say one a month, two a month, I think that that's more realistic. Okay, we can say two per month, and then out. Let's see, hours is uh, uh, somebody. I'm going to start taking notes here. Eight to five p.m. is the hours. Frequency of deliveries. I know you said something. What did you say in your application? Yeah, it's uh, it's in these. Let's see. So I I listed four per week. So okay. it's not quite one a day, but we okay. We'll yeah. say four per week, yeah. and then products and materials will be stored indoors. Correct. Stored indoors. And I mean, if we have to say what they are, why, why can't we just say um, those products typically used, you know, in it's, connection it's, with a design business like yours? Yeah, it's and, it's architectural millwork is what we make. So oh, OK. Well, that we can say that. Perfect. Trim and siding products. And um, Mr. Chair, it, I, I believe the applicant already sort of described that in the application itself. So if it's right. already described in the application. We can just um, say as set yeah, forth in the application. As set forth in yeah, the application. I was pretty specific in there. Yeah. So. Okay. So. And then um, number one is clients per week, hour and frequency delivers. I think we said that. Um, and then we did, uh, Mr. Chair, sorry to interrupt. Yes, please, um, please. We did, the applicant did stay four per week for frequency but i think we also need the hours stated but the hours are open is 8 to 5 p.m yeah. so the delivery hours would match the open hours they, yeah they'd have to be between 8 and 5 p.m four times mm -hmm. a week if that works okay yeah. um and then i think that might be it goods won't be offered for sale hours are 8 a.m to 5 p.m uh monday through friday right yep yeah. yeah. and um Frequency of delivery would be four times a week between 8 a.m. 8 and 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. Correct. Um, we actually limit our deliveries until 3 p.m. Because okay. if we say 5, they'll show up at 6. And then it's interrupting my dinner to... Oh, okay. So why don't we say between <laughs> 3 three and... What was it? 3 and 5 p.m. for the no, no, deliveries no. for... Well, as far yeah. as compliance with the regulations, they're agreeing to be in compliance with yeah. Uh, do we orders. need to give all of these specificities if they're within the thresholds? Uh, yeah, Nathan. I mean, you know, um, my oh. opinion right now is that, I mean, you know, if we say the hours of operation is eight to five, you know, by stating that the deliveries uh, would be also within the same hours okay. of operation. Okay. I think that works then. Okay. sensible. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, and then per 352.1e, one year after the permit decision, the applicant will perform one renewal. So you come back to our board. It'll be good for perpetuity as long as the home business continues to meet the conditions. If a change causes the home business to not meet the conditions, then they have to apply for another special permit. That also gives the public a chance to come back and say, wait a minute, this is what's happened in the last year is not what we heard on April 13th, 2023, that kind of thing. So um, are there any other members of the public? I'm not seeing anyone other than Ms. Bricker, um, right? Okay. 
So uh, seeing no other members of the public, um, I guess I'll ask the board, do we feel we have enough information to close the public hearing, which again would mean that neither the applicants nor members of the public can even say anything to us. So I emphasize that because so many times we close the public hearing and then we have another question for the applicant. But I think we've kind of covered this. Yeah, Sarah, go ahead. You, are you muted, Sarah? No, sorry, I was waiting to Ms. Oh. Brecker. Oh, okay. Um, she was leaving. Uh, okay. Are we? Do we? Are we ready for a motion to close the public hearing? Maureen, any other questions? No. Okay. A uh, motion to close the public hearing. Oh, in terms of who's voting, I guess technically it should be Sarah, Elizabeth, and me as the full members. Does that? I suppose that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So motion on to close the public hearing. So moved. And second. second. And then we need a roll call since we're virtual, please, Nathan. Yes. Um, give me one second. Mm -hmm. Okay. By roll call, um, Dave Bloomberg. Uh, yes, I vote yes to close the public hearing. Close the public hearing. Uh, Northrop. Yes. Silver. Yes. Okay, that's unanimous. So the public hearing is closed. Are we ready for a motion on the application for the special permit? Sure. Yes, we are. I don't, I, unless anybody has anything they want to say about the application before going into the motion. No, I'm happy if you were uh, willing to. All right. So, start yeah, let's, framing let's, those conditions. Yes, let's do this. Um, all right. So, I move that we approve the uh, request of the special permit. Um, and as the conditions of um, providing this permit, uh, one, goods will not be offered for sale. Two, the hours of operation will be 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday through Friday. Um, the frequency or hours of delivery, there will be up to four deliveries per week. That will be done between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. Um, there will be two total number of employees on site two. Um, let's see. The products will be limited to architectural millwork and they'll be kept indoors. Thank you. That's good. And uh, there won't be any goods offered for sale if i didn't say that already um and then i think it's i don't think we need to specify because it's part of the permit that it comes back in a year is that right correct okay yeah i think so, that's under the ordinance recording so okay so, uh, local recording going on thank you okay. thank you nathan um i think that covers it is there anything else that yeah and just accept and then and and otherwise as set forth in the application, which I think is implied, except to the extent this is different than in the application. Um, uh, before, uh, well, let's do a second and then I have one sentence of discussion. So is there a second on that second. motion? Okay, discussion. Um, Nathan, I forgot to ask, we haven't heard any, there are no comments from DPW, correct? Or fire or police or safety? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no comments. I did okay. see one by DPW that had no concerns. Okay. In the, in the file. Yeah. Great. Okay. So um, I, yeah. I apologize, Chair. So, and a sure. couple, there are a couple of conditions you earlier brought up that, that was not stated right now. That yeah, go ahead. Um, one is um, the special permit is not an overt approval of the sign. Yes. Oh. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. That we, that it should not be construed as an approval of the sign. The sign has to comply otherwise. And this, permit does not have the effect of approving the sign, which as Maureen pointed out is, is not technically in compliance. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the second is um, the, you know, the applicant accepts the assessor's area measurements. Oh, right. For the home <laughs> Ooh, business yeah. purposes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. Okay. Good yeah. catch. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll include that. That the, um, how do we say that, that, that uh, we, we accept we accept the measurements for purposes of calculating the percentage of total area used for the business based on the 
assessors and the measurements provided by Nathan and and his office. Is that cover it? Or I think that that might work. Or another more general, you can say, um, you know, the uh, we are uh, the city and the applicant will be using the assessor measures one measurements for determining compliance with two point one home business definition. Okay, yeah, that that probably is better. It's more general. I agree. All right. Okay, so 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 those those have been. Can we agree that those are at those are two added yes, statements yes. to the motion as presented? I would suggest adding the word current assessor. The assessor measurements as of today, because they occasionally get corrected or you know more specific. But isn't the whole point that we we use the assessors? measurements as they might change from time to time because the whole point is we're using the assessor's measurements to just stick with that even if they get yeah corrected rather than changing our basis right okay. doesn't that make sense yeah okay. that's better thank you okay okay uh I think, so I think we get it all in there is there a, is there a second <laughs> second yeah as amend with those additional uh amendments or conditions uh, okay, so now I think I think we're ready for a roll call vote on the motion with those various conditions and, and amendments that were just articulated. So I believe we got a first, but not a second. Oh, okay, Sarah seconded. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah. Okay, got it. Uh, so by roll call, um, Bloomberg. Yes, please. Yes, I vote in favor. And uh, Northrop. Yes. Silver. Yes. Okay, that's unanimous. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your patience and uh, good and best and thank, of luck. I will thank you for being stewards of such a amazing piece of property. Yeah, it is special. It's our honor. We we uh -huh. uh, we enjoy it. It is a labor of love. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I go past there every day on my walking trips and yeah. I see your little goats and they're adorable. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you are not owners, you are custodians. That's right. Yeah. 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 True. True. For, while we're here, yeah. we're, we're, uh, glad to, we're glad to caretake. Thank God it's a custodian because sometimes it would be like, who's next in line? I'd love to hand over the keys. <laughs> <laughs> it's and, a and, special combination of skills and patience. Yeah, yeah of course. Yep, we're taking off to Costa Rica. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, in about 15 years, years when our five year old moves out. Yep. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, right. good luck. Thank good you. Luck. Thank you. Thanks Thank very you much. Yeah. You're welcome. Appreciate and, and, all your help, Nathan. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Yes. Th and thank you, for, Nathan, from us as well. We have a couple more things to talk yes, about, but we do. Nathan, thank you for such a thorough yes. analysis. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, I think, yeah. is it just one set of minutes that we have? Um, yes. And I looked at them. I wasn't there for that meeting. Did people have a chance to review? Are they ready? To I did. Move? I would oh. move that we accept the minutes. Okay. And second. I have one. Oh, yes, please. Please. Uh, on the, uh, <laughs> I think it's an amendment. Uh, 6.09 p.m. Nathan Chung explained the next meeting on 4.13. You just notified us that the next meeting would be 4.13. You didn't talk about the meeting, right, Nathan? The word explained doesn't. Oh, yes. I'll, I'll correct that. Yes. Um, notified. Got it. I just updated literally now. Oh, yeah. Notified Thank that you. the next meeting would be. Yeah. Good. Anything else? Nope. It's a good, good catch. Um, so I guess just uh, roll call. Let's see who votes on this. I because I wasn't there. Do do I still vote or does it not matter? Not high. It's I think the the people present. So the people present were were um, um, Elizabeth Silver, Bob Riddle, and Maureen Scallon. Okay, so the three of them can vote. Uh, can move in second and vote on the, approving the min those minutes. Uh, I think I already moved that we accept the minutes. Okay. All right. Okay. Second. Oh, second. Okay. Second, and then roll call. Yes, by roll call, uh, Riddle. Yes. Uh, Silver. Yes. And Scanlon. Yes. Okay, unanimous. Great. That's unanimous. And, uh, I think you probably can stop recording if you'd like, but um, just wanted to double check on. I know we don't. You said we don't have a meeting on the twenty seventh. Uh, how's it looking for the eleventh? Um. That's up in the air. It's still okay. a month away, so 
there might be a permit that comes in soon. So um, okay. it's I can't say for sure. Okay. Um, and then I, normally, oh, just go ahead. No, go ahead. Normally, we just I believe we have one meeting in July and one in August typically because of vacations. Um, and just in that regard, I am actually, let's see, for July, let's see, it looks like the second, uh, first Thursday is the third, or the second Thursday is the 13th. Yes, the, uh, the 13th of July, I'm actually going to be in London again, I'm happy to say, visiting my daughter again. So, um, and I'll be probably out of the country as well. Okay. So I, will be in Maine. I will be in Maine. So how does the, the, the next, the four, uh, fourth Thursday, which would be the 27th of July, do that, does that work for people as far as you know? Uh, as far as I know now, I'll be back. Yeah, I know it's me, way, but, it's way yeah, off. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but maybe for now we can agree yeah. that, maybe for now we can agree we won't have a meeting on July 13th because at least two of us will be out of the country. All right. And then uh, anything else? Any other administrative things? No, I wanted to echo your thanks to Nathan. I really appreciate how much um, substance you get in the um, memos that you're sending us and the links and all of the work that you've gone to to Thanks. highlight the ordinances and um, all of the information. It's just incredibly helpful, especially yeah. this. This was new one for me in terms of the percentage of uh, square footage. You know, we've had home businesses, but um, nothing like this. So I just wanted to echo the thanks to you for all the very comprehensive work that you've done to put this yeah. all together. Yeah, really outstanding. Yeah. So th I guess, thank you. I guess we're ready for motion to adjourn, right? So moved. Second. OK, <laughs> and just, uh, I guess, roll call on that motion to adjourn, please. Oh, yes. Um, Bloomberg? Uh, yes. Silver? Yes. Northrop? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody.